Hello there and happy Wednesday evening. Um, I'm actually off work this week, but got some great questions sent my way that I was just like, I, I'm gonna sign on and um, share with you all because uh, you always send me great questions and I love to answer them. So by the way, if we haven't met, my name is Julie Hirschberg. I'm a neurologic physical therapist. I'm the owner and founder of Reactive Therapy and Wellness. And this week on my week off, I am I am, I am a sister and an auntie. My sister just had a new baby. I took the week off to help her out and I've been playing Princess Unicorns all day long with my niece and having a blast. So um, I'm just gonna take a little brain switch to go over to Functional Tremor. And I'm going to share this great question. This was from Lucy. Thank you for sending this question. Um, she's a physiotherapist in Canada. And she came across uh, our channel from other PTs online. So thank you so much for, for sharing about Reactive. And um, she is wanting recommendations for treatment for a person with functional movement disorder. This person is having spontaneous tremors in the face and movement of the jaw uh laterally blinking shutting of the eyes um she also had referred them to um speech therapy which is awesome as well as psychology which is awesome and she is finding that she can help this person get better so first of all i want to say high five to lucy because she's already helping them get better when that person is focused on an automatic task and this is a hallmark of treatment is kind of unlocking some of that automatic motor control within a task. So Lucy's already found found that this person's tremors are better. Um, but when she's done with the task, they go right back. So this is such a common challenge. And I just wanted to say, Lucy, you are not alone, right? Like this is a challenge for all of us. We might do some motor training or sensory training or um, other kinds of autonomic training. And then as soon as we stop that, the tremors are back or the dystonia is back or the weakness is back. That is not unusual. And in fact, it actually tells us a lot about what we're doing and how helpful it is. So this this is this is an opportunity for us to continue to explore that. So, um, okay, Zia, great question. Will this information only apply to functional tremor or could you apply it to functional myoclonus clonus, dystonia, posturing, and ataxia. Yes, we can apply this to all of them, although I'm going to start with the research because you know me, I love my research, and this particular paper was on functional tremor. But some of the principles that they studied as far as attentional uh, focus is not just tremor related. So you can apply this to functional dystonia, functional myoclonus, uh, functional ataxia. You could apply it to any of those. What a great question. So uh, by the way, if you aren't on our newsletter, I'll put a link to this article on there, reactiveeducation.com if you're a clinician, reactivept.com if you're a patient. The article is from the journal Brain and the title is Misdirected Attentional Focus in Functional Functional Tremor. Anne Catherine Hughes is the first author. And um, this is out of the UK, this study. Um, this is from 2021, so fairly recent. This is such an interesting study. So let me tell you what they did. They took folks with functional tremor and compared them to people with another type of tremor. Now, I gotta tell you in the study, 
they called it organic tremor versus non-organic tremor. And I already kind of went off on my soapbox last week that I don't like that distinction. So I don't like the distinction in this article, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to let them go right now on that. And maybe they've already changed their tune. It's been a couple of years, but they compared people with functional tremor to healthy controls and to those with another type of tremor, like essential tremor for example. And then they did a reaching to a target task that was tracked with, uh, it was a computer reaching task and um, it gave people feedback. This was such a, such a well-designed study. When it comes to motor control and motor learning, a lot of the studies are these reaching uh, type tasks that are kind of simple. Maybe it's not something we would do every day, but it's a good way to look at how people change with when you change different pieces of feedback, which is a huge part of motor control and motor learning. Here is what they found. They found that uh, motor performance deteriorated when the attention was given to visual feedback indirect visual feedback. Um, and it also was worsened when, um, when attention was given to the accuracy or if the person was asked to move more slowly. The movement improved when people did not have visual feedback. So I think this is really key. What is it about visual feedback? And especially with a functional movement disorder, um, let's see, um, motor. So this is interesting because that is across all people. Hello. Like this is why I think functional neurologic disorder is so interesting because this phenomena of paying attention and overly attending to visual feedback impairs movement in all people, not just people with functional neurologic disorders. However, it was only the people with functional tremor that the motor performance improved when it was performed as a preparatory movement. Again, this is how they set it up. So a preparatory movement, meaning it wasn't the actual uh, task at hand, but it was the preparation for the task. Those those types of movements are organized very differently in the brain. So very interesting. So they found that people with functional tremor improved when they had um, less visual feedback and more distraction. They also found that that at the where the uh, attention was allocated was altered in functional tremor. And it, what this is what they say at the end here. The attention is disproportionately directed towards the ongoing visual feedback of the moving hand. This altered attention may be partly responsible for the tremor since it also worsens motor performance in healthy control participants and patients with other types of tremor. It may have a detrimental impact through interference with automatic movement processes. So I, I give you this and I give you this evidence because what it confirms for us in a functional movement disorder is that there is an altered attentional focus that directly contributes to the appearance of the tremor. And this is why Lucy, who sent this question, said it gets better when we are doing a task but then once we end the task, it gets worse again. And I would guess that is due to this altered attentional focus. Now, I want to say a couple of things. That altered attentional focus is not on purpose. The person 
doesn't really have a lot of control of that. This has been a learned and ingrained neuroplastic brain behavior. And as a, as a physical therapist, Lucy is actually interrupting and starting to retrain the attentional focus. And it's not that different from the attentional focus that occurs after we have a dizziness event, right? So if you've ever had a dizziness event like BPPV or um, a, a, a ear infection that caused dizziness, when that occurs, we actually become very visually dependent, meaning we use our vision a lot to help keep us steady. And then as we get better, we, we use less of that visual information. Now, the attentional focus gets, gets gone to vision. And what they found in the study with functional tremor, these, these folks were also highly utilizing and attending to visual feedback. Not uncommon in the presence of tremor or honestly dystonia or myoclonus. So Zia, you asked that question, great question. Uh, the visual feedback and the attention to that visual feedback can actually be driving and worsening the, the cycle of that movement. Now, why would a person develop a reliance on visual feedback? And why might they attend to what the movement looks like versus just producing that automatic movement, which we know is capable for a lot of folks with functional neurologic disorders, but it's not always accessible for them. So why might this occur? One can be that they had a physical injury and they needed to attend to that limb. Very common as the onset of functional neurologic disorder. So this developed. As I mentioned in a dizziness onslaught, it makes a lot of sense that we start to rely and attend to our visual input instead. Um, what we have also found and what the research has also found in functional movement disorders is that the sensory feedback from the body might be impaired. So I actually asked Lucy this, who asked this great question, how can I help get carryover? I, I, I wonder about this person's sensory perception of their face, their jaw, their mouth. So this person has uh, excessive movement and tremor um, and uh, movement disorder in their, in their face, their eyes, their jaws, their, their mouth. So what now that can occur when a person is not getting accurate sensory feedback from their face. So from, from their joints, so uh, from their temporal mandibular joint, from their eyes um, and around their face. So I would wanna know. Now it's not usually that the person has, um, impaired sensation in the sense that they have some sort of peripheral nerve injury and they cannot feel their face, although that can happen and that can actually cause facial spasms as well. But typically as a physical therapist, we would test that and we just test whether the person can feel their face and we see um, a an impairment of sensation. That can occur, but that is not typically what happens in a functional neurologic disorder. Instead, it's a little higher order sensation that might be impaired. So this might be two point discrimination. I would highly recommend testing that. This might be joint proprioception or kinesthesia. A little harder to test in the face, but you can still test it by matching facial movements. Um, and that you could have them match to your facial movements. Um, and you can test joint proprioception in the jaw. Absolutely. Um, and then you could do something like sensory discrimination testing with something like the grid. So um, 
I just grabbed the first thing I had here, which is a greeting card. And I, I drew a little grid on here. And what you would do is actually do this where the person is having most of their symptoms. So I'm kind of guessing around here for this person. And so you would draw, and I, I won't draw this on my face right now for you all, but I would draw this grid on their face one two three four five six seven eight nine and what we do to test this out is actually have them close their eyes and identify if you are touching in one two three four five six seven eight nine and compare it side to side and can the person perceive and discriminate um between those different areas. And that would tell us a little bit, oh, I gotta grab my brain. That would tell us a little bit about what that map, so I'm pointing at the somatosensory cortex right here, what the map, what the homunculus of their face and jaw looks like. And Lucy is saying, yes, in the jaw, worse than sitting, than lying down. So even that, Lucy is such a great clue. Lying down, the person is getting a lot of sensory input to their head, their neck, and it's probably allowing them to get more feedback to their joints and where they are in space, especially around their face and their eyes. So I would guess that this person may have the part of the underlying issue might be sensory. We only can know if if we test it. And again, I would test joint proprioception and kinesthesia. I would do two point discrimination and then I would do sensory discrimination with the grid. Other quick ways you could test sensation would be graphesthesia. So that is drawing a number or a letter on the face and around the jaw. And can they identify what that is? Uh, you can't really do stereognosis, although I've never done it inside the mouth. I'd have to ask my speech language pathologist friends, but it, it might be kind of interesting to do an in the mouth stereognosis. Like, what is this, right? That doesn't have to do with taste, but moving it around in your mouth. I'm kind of intrigued by this idea. I never thought about it. You can check with your, with your speech therapist friends about doing stereognosis in the mouth. So that would be the first place I would start because you will get, and the person, I shouldn't say you will, the person will get more carryover of functional training when they're getting accurate sensory feedback about their body. And I find that with tremor, dystonia, myoclonus, there might be, and this isn't the only thing, but it's one piece of the pie, there might be a sensory uh, component. Um, and Lucy also says the spontaneous blinking or blepharospasm also worth, worse in sitting and not so much in supine. So the second question I would ask there, and this kind of goes back to the pie chart every single time for me. We talked about the sensory piece of the pie might be autonomic. So whenever I see also that a person has more symptoms in sitting or standing versus supine, I want to test their autonomic nervous system. Is there a change in their blood pressure and heart rate with those changes? I also would do an active stand test and see them in standing over time. I'm screening for the presence of POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome, but also generally orthostatic intolerance. I also just want to look generally where their heart rate is in resting. And I also love to look at heart rate variability. It's a little window to the autonomic nervous system. But sometimes excessive movement, so tremor, myoclonus, dystonia, sometimes those are autonomically related. Now, sometimes that person needs to move and contract muscles to get more blood flow to their brain. Totally makes sense if they're having orthostatic intolerance or POTS. But if that's not the case for the person, again, screen their autonomic nervous system, it can be more of the autonomic nervous system and nervous system regulation. So they can be experiencing more tremor, myoclonus, dystonia, etc., because their nervous system is frankly just 
totally overflowing. And this is where we use the river runneth over analogy a lot. Um, if you haven't seen that before, I'll put it in our newsletter uh, this week. As a reminder, I have a couple of videos showing the diagram with the river and many things might be contributing to a person's tremor. Again, it could be autonomic in nature, it could be sensory in nature. So visual stimuli, vestibular stimuli, temperature, uh, sound, all of those things might be contributing. And sometimes what we can see is tremor is that outflow, that overflow of a nervous system dysregulated. So in addition, so again, I want to remind you, Lucy found improvement when that person was doing an engaging functional task. That's awesome. They just wanted more carryover of that after the person stops that engaging task. And a part of that carryover might be sensory and autonomic regulation, right? It sounds like you found a motor control piece where you unlocked autonomic movement. They may just need more. And what I would say for this is um, so we had sensory and autonomic would be that to not get discouraged that a one-time practice doesn't carry over right after. I don't know many neurologic disorders that respond with a one-time piece, but I have heard from others that there's a like higher expectation that that might occur with functional neurologic disorders and they're like other neurologic disorders. It, it can take practice of accessing these autonom automatic movements, not autonomic movements, automatic movements in many different scenarios. So it sounds like, Lucy, you found a really safe place for the person to practice an engaging activity and they had more automatic movements in their face and their jaw. Awesome. Now we just need to practice and practice and find ways to take that over um, at, at home as well. And so typically what I have found is that means we need to get really creative to find many other ways that automatic movement it, it is available to that person. So um, it may be that you found it in a particular task within the clinic. So maybe they were laying down, maybe they were singing. I think that's a great automatic movement. It's also regulating for the autonomic nervous system. So maybe you found singing and laying down, but this poor person cannot sing and lay down all day long, right? So now you're gonna work into different positions. So maybe then you're gonna be at a slight incline, then work your way to upright. Maybe they can do it with a little more input down through their head and neck. So you're gonna try some postural and positional pieces to give them a little more feedback, have them improve their uh, safety and awareness of their body so that they can do this at home. So there's a part of that that might be changing postures and positions over time. There's a part of that that might be creatively finding novel, usually ways to access that autonomic movement. So I mentioned things like singing, um, but yeah, it might be singing. It might be lip singing to your, your favorite song. It might be, and again, I'm, I'm Lucy, I'm giving you a bunch of things that I've used for um, things around the face and the jaw. It might be humming. It might be, oh, one of this was really fun. My daughter did this. Um, it might be actually doing a game of testing and tasting things in the mouth. My daughter did this with these, um, Oh, it was a particular brand of gummy bears. And you could really taste um, all these unique flavors. And she made a whole game out of it. Like, can you can you find which one is watermelon? And can you find pear and, and things like that? That would be a great novel automatic task. 
that that person can do. Now, I'm not expecting the gummy bear game to go on all day long, right? That That's not the point of this. But I will tell you, absolutely, with practice and training, as the person repeats more automatic movements, they become more accessible to the person, especially if you're treating the nervous system regulation, the sensory part, the autonomic part, maybe there's lifestyle pieces as well, psychosocial pieces, physical impairments. If you're treating all of those at the same time, the more ways you can practice that automatic movement, the more easily accessible it will be. And it doesn't mean the person needs to be distracted. I, I actually don't really like the word distraction because it, it kind of sounds like we're deceiving somebody into doing automatic movement. What I really think about is that we are giving somebody a very strong externally focused goal that that is that's what we know in motor learning is so helpful so an externally focused goal that then allows them to achieve more automatic movement. That's really what I think in our motor control training. And Lucy, I see, yeah, they were very anxious. I'm referring them to counseling. Great. And you know what? I would be anxious too if my face was doing involuntary movements and sometimes my eyes were closing. It would make it very hard to to be in everyday life. And so I think most folks that experience any kind of neurologic disorder will end up developing some sort of anxiety and even depression because of the change this has had on their life. And this is why I highly, highly advocate for having a psychologist on board with the team. The other thing I would say is that our fears our anxieties can also really contribute to that nervous system dysregulation. And so again, having physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychology, speech therapy, all working together for nervous system regulation is like, that's a home run. That's a home run for your nervous system, addressing it from all avenues. What, you know, first of all, y'all should go see Lucy. I think she's in Vancouver. What a great therapist advocating for their patient. It just bowls me over. You're awesome, Lucy. Um, okay, and then Zia asked, is it better to not to do anything when you're having the movements or to do it through the movements anyway? Zia, here, what a what a good question. And you know, I, I don't know you, Zia, or what's happening in your movements. And for some people, it could be really unsafe to move through them. So I can't give you personal advice, but I will tell you how our team would approach that. Generally speaking, we don't want a person to completely shut down their life because of the movements, the myoclonus, the dystonia, the tremor that is occurring. What we actually find is when people engage in life, they usually have more access to automatic movements because in life, we're not just trying to walk or sit or stand, we're trying to get a cup of coffee and we're talking to our friend over here. Or if you're like me, you're playing unicorn princess ponies all day long. And it's not about the focus or the visual feedback like this study talked about that we're doing. It's about a goal orientation. So if it is safe for a person to move, yes, keep moving and keep doing. We want to keep people uh, engaged in life as much as possible. But um, of course, this can't really be medical personal advice. I don't know if that's safe for you. Um, okay, going going down here, Lauren says, my fingers and hands get stuck in certain positions. What's the best thing to do? So I also don't know your case exactly, Lauren, but just like I talked through for Lucy's clinical questions, she's a physical therapist in Vancouver, by the way, y'all should go see Lucy, um, that you want to look at the underlying why. And this is why with our team, I keep doing this because this is my 
the pie chart, we break down and assess, is there a sensory issue contributing to abnormal posturing or positioning in your hands? Is there an autonomic piece? Is there a physical impairment? What's happening with the motor control there? Looking at all of those pieces to understand what's going on. Um, for you. So what I would say is getting connected to a team that can help you figure that out. And maybe you already know some of the sensory or autonomic people, pieces of people. <laughs> um, I'm a sensory and autonomic person, I can tell you that, but it, maybe you already know some of those pieces and you can start exploring some of the sensory or autonomic nervous system regulation um, pieces to help yourself. Um, and Zia says, I promise you that anxiety is a normal reaction, isn't it? Exactly, Dia. It's a totally normal reaction to anyone experiencing neurologic symptoms, not just FND, but to to every neurologic disorder. Um, yes, and Zia says, I do so much better when my therapist acknowledges that my anxiety is normal than trying to fix it. Zia, that's such a great lesson to all of the therapists here, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists. Any amount of anxiety when you're having involuntary movements is totally normal. It is totally normal. In fact, if you didn't have anxiety, I'd be kind of wondering why not. Because if you have lost a sense of control of your body, it's anxiety producing. All of our therapists should be acknowledging that uh, for for people I'm not trying to fix it, but trying to help that person discover ways that they can regain control, regain a normal focus of attention for their movement, regain safety and understanding in their body. That's what we should all be doing. What a great point. Look at all of these folks on here. Um, Lucy also says, after sensory assessment, they have trouble discriminating between points or discriminating drawing on the face. Should we spend half the time training the face for sensory discrimination? Yes. Yeah, so if you find that the person has impairment there, you're going to train it. Now, you could actually train it with the grid training on the face and have them identify it. But you could also do it in many other ways and and things that are maybe more fun. So I love stamps and identifying the picture of the stamp on the face. Um, that's something, by the way, that the person can do themselves. They don't always have to have another person there. They can also do it with training and discriminating different textures or temperatures on the face. That's a great one. I still I still have my little chiming um, uh, Chinese balls here. I don't know if you can hear it. I got these for, for my friend Lily, the brain PT, because I had them on another live. But discriminating um, this is nice and cold and putting this with something warm, um, that could be a really great activity. I might use, you know, they have all these great face things now, the little rollers and things like that, discriminating different sizes or shapes of those rollers. That would be really fun and relaxing to do as well. Um, so now the, as far as the amount of time, I will tell you, from clinical experience, I have done the testing. I start training it and I don't, I don't see a big change or they're, um, they're not improving with that or actually some of that attentional focus on the sensory system is actually making things worse. So I wanna give you permission, Lucy, to abandon ship um, if that is happening. It, it happens. This is why I tell people this is a, not a one size fits all approach. Not and not everybody, even if they have the impairment, are going to respond well to sensory training. So I might make a shift to the kinds of sensation that I'm training. Um, so Lucy, there's not a prescription here of like half sensory training and half automatic movements. Uh, and and I got to tell you, although I, I love my pie chart and I really like kind of tend to an organized, have an organized kind of like 
thought process with all my treatments, when I'm in the moment, when I'm with a patient, we are really flowing with the intervention. In fact, I would say if you could do the like mega trifecta of doing some of the automatic movements and getting sensory feedback and doing getting some autonomic and nervous system regulation all at the same time, win, win, win. And do that for the entire session and build in that session the things that that person is going to be able to do um, at home. Yeah, and and here we go, right here is Zia. Zia says, a lot of these suggestions involve touch. What if that's triggering? Then don't do it. Yes, absolutely. So this is why you have to test it out. But if touch is actually triggering, we want to figure out why. But normally what I find if touch is extra sensitive or there's some allodynia, I actually need to work with that person for nervous system regulation first. So that might be that we need to do some autonomic nervous system pieces initially before we can even train the sensory system. And then I'm gonna train the sensory system not with touch. I might use proprioception. Um, that person might respond better with vibration or weight. Oh my gosh, Lucy, you got to try some weighted eyelashes. That is some of the best stuff that I've ever seen with eyes and blepharospasm. So weighted eyelashes might be really helpful. But if the touch sensation is triggering, we've got to go in the door of another sensory system. Great point. Is there a link to the grid test? Lucy, I'm going to make myself a note that I'm going to put, there is an article in, um, ooh, I forget which journal, um, but I'll put a link to it. And they actually go through the testing and progression of treatment. Um, and they did it in frozen shoulder and people got better in like two visits phenomenal. So um, I that hasn't been published in FND, um, but it's published in other disorders where sensory perception is impaired. So I will put the link to that article in our newsletter. I'm guessing you're on our newsletter, Lucy, but if you're not, get yourself on it. It's You can sign up at reactiveeducation.com. If you're a patient, sign up at reactivept.com. Um, Lauren is asking, how often do you see patients that are originally diagnosed with FND, but it turns out to be something like MS, etc.? You know, Lauren, I'm not a neurologist, so I don't do a, I don't do diagnosing, but I teach differential diagnosis to other physical therapy students. I teach at USC, and this is my passion. And what we do a lot at Reactive is if we have somebody with FND and we're starting to go, mm, we don't think this is FND, or it's FND and something else, we are referring them out. And I'm going to tell you in my career so far, I have yet to find somebody that was diagnosed with FND and it was actually something else. But I will tell you, I've seen loads of folks with FND who also, who do have functional neurologic disorders and also have another neurologic disorder. And it's important to treat both. And here's what's great, neurologic rehabilitation, very effective for neurologic disorders, very effective for FND, very effective for MS, very effective for folks with hypermobility. So screening for the presence of other disorders is really, really important. Now in the literature, the misdiagnosis of FND is actually pretty rare. It's actually higher. So you brought up the example of MS. It's higher that folks with MS are wrongly diagnosed with F with MS when it was actually FND and go through a ton of treatment that is not without risks and they actually had FND. So that misdiagnosis is higher than the misdiagnosis that it's FND, but it was actually MS. But it does happen. The most recent, I, I, I won't be able to quote you which um, article, but I did read an article recently and it was about 4%. Um, which is about the 
the misdiagnosis rate for all neurologic disorders. And um, I think it's important, this is why as physical therapists, getting our doctorate, a huge part of our training is in differential diagnosis, meaning when somebody comes to us, we screen their whole nervous system, cardiovascularly, um, uh, respiratory, we screen every system for for signs and symptoms of another disorder. And I think that is really important that what we are treating is correct. Okay, I'm gonna have to sign off here in just a minute, but I see a couple more questions. Lucy, where can I get the weighted eyelashes? Oh, they're not special. They are, um, they're really uh, all over the place. In fact, I got some at Target the other day. They're um, fake eyelashes that come with little magnets on them and they stick to a magnetic eyeliner. So those little magnets are like weights and you can get different sizes of them. And you can get really fun ones. I don't know the person that you're working with, but if it were me, I would love really fun ones, like bright blue ones and bright purple. Like that's what I would get me. And so you can see based on that person's personality, like what kind of eyelash would be, would be fun for them. But that's a great one for it's externally focused, right? And it, it changes um, the sensory input to that person's eye. So cool. Um, okay. And, um, um, oh, here's multiple diagnoses. These are things that we see together all of the time. CRPS, allodynia, hyperalgesia, dystonia, and now FND. You are not alone um, in having those diagnoses together. Um, and we see that frequently. And here's the good news, that pie chart that I talked about in looking at the sensory systems and autonomic and motor control and lifestyle and the physical impairments and psychosocial contributors can be helpful for all of those things. And I think what is most important, if, if you're one of the people that really kind of ends up with a long list of diagnoses. It's, it's not unusual. I think it's important to understand what is the underlying common components of all of those things. For example, in CRPS and FND, autonomic and sensory systems underlie both of those. Same with hyperalgesia and all allodynia so, and, and also dystonia. So we have to get to the bottom of those pieces to help a person and not just treat symptoms and not just put a band-aid on it. So I'm, I'm glad you're reaching out for resources. I'm glad you're getting what you're need, you need. Okay, last two pieces here. I love your FND videos. Ah, thank you for coming, little bug 69. Um, and Lucy, I'm seeing the client one to two times a week. Great, giving them education and home exercise program for the other days. That's a great treatment frequency. I will tell you at Reactive, we do an intensive base program for people. We're seeing them every day of the week, usually four or five days a week for PT, um, three to four days for OT, twice a week for PT. That's a model, but a traditional outpatient model can also work. Um, and I think really empowering the person you're working with, with a lot of, of resources during the week can be helpful. Um, Littlebug69 says, I have a patient with FND that I try so hard to come up with great things. Do we have the most amazing therapists in this community? Yes, so glad. Oh my gosh. You're coming to work with us. Yay, I'm so excited. Um, can't wait. And Zia, thank you for being here. I'm gonna tell you, Zia, thank you. Um, and other folks on here who ask questions, who share their stories, I learn more from you than any textbook I could ever read. So thank you. Again, if you're not on our newsletter, Clinicians, sign up at reactiveeducation.com. I'm going to send these videos. I'm going to send the articles. I'm going to send all of that every single week. You should get on it. If you're a patient, sign up at reactivept.com. I send a similar newsletter, but I don't send you all of our therapist-related education courses. So it's a little more simple. 
Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for your great questions. Lucy, keep me posted on how things go. And I'll see you again soon. Thanks so much.